Good morning, everybody. What a beautiful morning it is, too. Amen? It's a great day. Last week in our series, The Jesus Life, we talked about the birth of John the Baptist and we talked about the birth of Jesus. We had Christmas in July. We sang a Christmas song. We drank some eggnog. We roasted chestnuts on, the op uh, on an open fire, right? No? You are celebrating Christmas in July, right? You know, that, that, that beautiful celebration that culminates with the MLB All-Star Game? No, that's not quite right, is it? But we did take a look at those birth narratives and begin to understand that Jesus has come. John came first to prepare our hearts for the coming of God's Son. And then today we are continuing our series, The Jesus Life. Learning how to live the life that Jesus has called us to live. You know, when you put your faith in Jesus and are forgiven your sins, you become a follower of Christ. You become a Christian. You become a disciple. And then when that happens for you, you have been given a new life. And that life is called the Jesus life. What does it mean to live the Jesus life? It means to take all that we learn about the life of Jesus and to live it. To live the life that he's calling us to live. So we as a church, we're taking a journey together to learn about this life of Jesus by studying Jesus' life. That makes sense, right? To live the Jesus life, you have to study the life of Jesus, right? And we're using as our source the Gospel of Luke for this time. So each week, we're going to look at a different part of Jesus' life and apply that learning to how we might live the Jesus life ourselves. So let's pray, and then we'll read our passage for this morning. Heavenly Father, we pray the words of Scripture. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Jesus, you are King over all. Speak, O Lord, for your servants are listening. Amen. Well, our passage today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3. We're going to read verses 1 through 22. If you're able to, please stand for, with us for the reading of Scripture today. Now, it was the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, the Roman emperor. Pontius Pilate was the governor of Judea. Herod Antipas was the ruler over Galilee. His brother Philip, the ruler over Iteria and Trachonitis. Licinius was the ruler over Abilene. Annas and Caiaphas were the high priests. At the, and at this time, a message from God came to John, the son of Zechariah, who was living in the wilderness. Then John went from place to place on both sides of the Jordan River, preaching that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. Isaiah had spoken of John when he said, He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. The valleys will be filled and the mountains and hills made level. The curves will be straightened and the rough places made smooth. And then all the people will see the salvation sent from God. When the crowds came to John the Baptist, he said, You brood of snakes, who warned you to flee the coming wrath? Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Don't just say to each other, We're safe. For we are descendants of Abraham, that means nothing. For I tell you, God can create children of Abraham from these very stones. Even now, the axe of God's judgment is poised, ready to sever the roots from the trees. Yes, every tree that does not produce good fruit will be chopped down and thrown into the fire. The crowds asked, What should we do? John replied, If you have two shirts, Give one to the poor. If you have food, share it with those who are hungry. Even corrupt tax collectors came to be baptized and asked, Teacher, what should we do? And he replied, Collect no more taxes than the government requires. What should we do? Asked some soldiers. John replied, Don't extort money or make false accusations. 
and be content with your pay. Everyone was expecting the Messiah to come soon, and they were eager to know whether John might be the Messiah. John answered their questions by saying, I baptize you with water, but someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I am not even worthy to be his slave and untie the straps of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He is ready to separate the chaff from the wheat with his winnowing fork. Then he will clean up the threshing area, gathering the wheat into his barn, but burning the chaff with a never-ending fire. John used many such warnings as he announced the good news to the people. John also publicly criticized Herod Antipas, the ruler of Galilee, for marrying Herodias, his brother's wife, and for many other wrongs that he had done. So Herod put John into prison, adding this sin to his many others. One day, when the crowds were being baptized, Jesus himself was baptized. As he was praying, the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit in bodily form descended on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, you are my dearly loved son and you bring me great joy. Word of the Lord. You may be seated. So today's passage is really all of chapter 3. But chapter 3 ends with a long list of names called a genealogy. It's a list of names that essentially is Jesus' family tree. And I've decided not to read this part, one, because I'm going to mess up the reading out loud of all of those names, 77 of them to be exact. But, I'm, but really I'm just going to talk in general about what this gen genealogy is saying to us about Jesus at the end of our sermon today. So we will be taking a look at that. And I'm going to send you away with some homework regarding Jesus' family tree, so you're going to love that. But right now, our attention is focused on what's happening in the desert around the Jordan River with John and then later Jesus. So, imagine massive floods are sweeping through the countryside. Ancient cities suddenly find themselves under several feet of water. People are not expecting this, and now they can't quite believe what's happening. If the authorities have enough warning, they will do their very best to get people out of their houses and stop them from being trapped. They drive around parts of the cities announcing that trouble is approaching and that people should leave at once. They make announcements on the radio and on television. You get those, those little messages that pop up on your phone and make a weird noise, right? Imminent danger lurks. Urgent action is needed, right? That's the kind of work that John the Baptist is doing. We don't usually think of preachers going around and making these frantic kind of announcements. And even politicians don't usually tell us that things are getting very urgent. Or if they do, we don't really pay attention to them anyway. But people believed John. And they came to him for a different sort of flooding, baptism, being plunged into the River Jordan. So what was this emergency and how would being plunged into the Jordan help people avoid danger? You know, this introduction that we read at the beginning of our passage this morning, it's designed to provide a precise location and a point in history when all of this occurred. Jesus was born when Caesar Augustus, Caesar Augustus was the emperor of Rome, but now it was his adopted son Tiberius who was the ruler. Also at the time of Christ, it was Herod the Great. He was still king of Israel. But now he has been succeeded by Herod Antipas and his brother Philip, who ruled over Iteria and Trachonitis. Now Rome allowed these puppet kings to rule over parts of the fractured kingdom of Israel. But Israel is a captive state at this moment, ruled by Rome. And Rome kept the best for herself, which is Judea, which included Jerusalem. Now over Jerusalem, there was a prefect, sometimes referred to as a governor. That guy's Pontius Pilate. And then the last pair of names that is mentioned is Annas and Caiaphas. These are the high priest of the temple of Jerusalem. Annas was the father of Caiaphas, and he was the former high priest, but, you know, he's still kind of hanging around. So this is really the cast of characters that were in positions of power and authority and rule over the people at the time of Jesus' ministry. And these people will be very important later in the story. 
that story that Luke gives us of the life of Jesus. And so they become important to us who are living the life, the Jesus life, right? The other thing that this elaborate introduction does is it serves not only as this historical point of reference, but also um, it mimics the opening lines of many of the prophetic books of the Old Testament. So this establishes John the Baptist as a prophet. And we noted that from the birth narratives last week, right? We said that John would be like a prophet of old in the vein of Elijah. But also behind all of this and behind that list of names and places is a story of oppression and suffering and misery that was all com coming to a boiling point, ready to explode. It was an inflection point where things were about to give. Tiberius, the emperor, was ruthless and he ruled with might by using the Roman legion to do whatever he wanted. And he kept control over the people in a very heavy-handed sort of way. Herod Antipas and his brother Philip had no real power and were given kind of regions or areas of, the, of, the, of Israel that Rome didn't really care about, didn't see as a threat. And the Sanhedrin was ruled by Annas and Caiaphas and they were in league with Rome and they were all about maintaining their power. Now popular movements of resistance had come and they had gone. In some cases they were brutally put down. And everyone knew that this just couldn't go on for much longer. Something had to happen. But what? Devout Jews had longed for a new word from God. Some believed that prophecy had, had died out, but, but one day would be restored and revived. And many expected that this movement would begin through which God would renew this age-old covenant, bringing Israel out of slavery and into new freedom. The old prophets had spoken of a time of renewal through which God himself would come back to them. And they had only a shaky idea of what this would look like. But then when this fiery prophet out in the wilderness in Judea was going around from town to town and telling people that the time had come, the people were really ready to listen. Enter John, screaming in the desert, repent and be baptized. Baptism plunging into the Jordan River was a powerful sign of this renewal. When the children of Israel had come out of Egypt, it's a story they all knew really well because of the continuing and regular Passover celebration, they knew that God had led Israel out of Egypt through the Red Sea, through the Sinai Desert, through the Jordan River itself into the Promised Land. And now they were in slavery again in their own land this time. And they wanted a new exodus to bring them freedom. And since the old prophets had declared that slavery was a result of Israel's sin, worshiping idols rather than their one true God, they knew that this new exodus, when it would happen, would have to deal with this in some way. The way to escape slavery, the prophets had said, was to return to God with heart and soul. That is, to repent. We know of this because the last prophet was Malachi, and he talks about this. He said, speaking for God, he said, I am the Lord, and I do not change. That is why you descendants of Jacob are not already destroyed. Ever since the days of your ancestors, you have scorned my decrees and failed to obey them. Now return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of heaven's armies. So John screams in the wilderness that the people should repent and be baptized. This is an indication of just how bad a shape the people were in. You see, baptism was part of the ritual for a Gentile to become a Jew. It was designed to symbolically demonstrate the purification needed to wash off the barbaric ways of the Gentile and embrace the purity of being one of God's chosen people. To have Jews baptized was to acknowledge that they had so corrupted themselves by sin that they needed to reinitiate themselves as Jews. That meant repentance and this purification. But John wasn't going to be satisfied here with a mere outward ritual in which many could hide their real selves behind an outward conformity to this new movement, God was coming back and he wasn't coming just to tell them that because they were Abraham's children that everything was gonna be okay. The reason that God was bringing rescue and salvation is precisely because 
the holy and faithful God was keeping his covenant with his people. But if that's so, he's bound to bring judgment as well as mercy because he's not a tame God. So John uses this picture, Jesus develops it later, of a tree that's meant to bear fruit. And if it doesn't, it'll be cut down. The fruit must show that repentance has been genuine. The warning echoes down through the years and it must be taken to heart to all who are baptized, even today. We cannot presume that because we have shared in the great Christian mystery, this new exodus coming through the waters of baptism, with all of that means that God will automatically be happy with us even if we show no signs of serious repentance. So, of course, Christian living, living the Jesus life is about far more than simply repentance, but it's certainly not less. All spiritual advance begins with a turning away from what is hindering our obedience. So if John were to come down this, our street today with a megaphone, what would he be saying? Preparing the Lord's way means preparing people through repentance, as was indicated by the tale of the two births last week. And so Luke includes this quote from Isaiah and these images of road building in Isaiah become images of repentance, right? Height and depth are leveled out and crooked and rough are made straight and smooth. This drastic transformation of terrain that obstructs travel becomes a symbol of repentance the Lord's coming requires. John calls the people to a total transformation. Repentance. Repentance is this. In skateboarding, there's a 180. That is, you're going along, then you press down on the back of the skateboard and you rotate your body 180 degrees and you're going in the opposite direction. For too long, people have been traveling down the road to destruction and now they're being called to return to God and make that 180 degree turn away from sin and destruction and toward God and toward salvation. And it started with this baptism drastically single, signaling that they were no longer just ordinary people living under Roman rule, that they were again God's people. Out of the water they came with questions. Luke gives us three examples of questions that arise from three different groups of people, but essentially the question is all the same. What now? Right? What now? How should my life look now that I have turned back to God? And only Luke's gospel records John's answer to the people's questions about this repentance. He answers the, his answers are very simple and practical. John's answers reveal a recognition that each calling in life has its own temptations and that it is the mark of a truly penitent to resist those temptations. People wanted to know what was expected of them. John's first answer, very intensely practical, says that people should share what they have with those who don't have any. Clothing, food, etc. Then tax collectors come. Now, this is a group of people that was hated the most among their countrymen because they worked for the Roman government. They worked for the very oppressors to collect taxes on their own people. They were traitors. They were corrupt. They were in it to profit off of their own neighbors. And to all of this, John says this, collect no more taxes than the government requires. The successful tax collector at that time would pay Rome the amount that they bid to collect from the people. But then they would collect more to pay for their own expenses and to give themselves a legitimate profit. But there was a very strong temptation to, level, to levy way more taxes than was strictly necessary and pocket the extra. And the tax collectors worked very closely with the soldiers and a centurion to enforce the collection. That is, if the snivelly little tax collector came up and said, we want this much money, and you said no, there was a detachment of Roman soldiers to, you know, kind of encourage you. The next group that comes up is soldiers, probably Jewish soldiers from the Sanhedrin, but it could also have been the Roman soldiers of the detachment that was there to, tax, to, to enforce the tax collection. And as a way to make more money, they often would bring false criminal charges against people and then strong arm them for bribes. And so John calls them to just do their jobs and be happy with their pay. 
not to bring false accusations or to extort people for money. Now notice that John does not call either of these groups to leave their jobs. Rather, he warns them to act uprightly in their jobs. He isn't calling for people not to pay taxes. He's calling tax collectors to be fair in the practice of the collection. He's calling soldiers to soldier and not to become war profiteers. He's calling the people to share what they have with those who have none, leveling out that road to prepare the hearts for the coming of the Messiah, the Lord, the King. Now Luke records John's word describing the coming of the Messiah. Everyone was expecting the Messiah to come soon, and they were eager to know whether John might be the Messiah, but John answered their questions by saying, I baptize you with water, but someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I am not even worthy to be his slave and untie the straps of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And he's ready to separate the chaff and the wheat with his winnowing fork, and then he will clean up the threshing floor, gathering the wheat into his barn and burning the chaff with a never-ending fire. Here again, we see this planned imbalance, right, between the greatness of John and the next level greatness of Jesus. I baptize you with water, said John, but someone is coming soon who is greater than I, so much greater, I'm not even worthy to be the slave that unties his sandals. That, by the way, was the lowest slave of all. It's a menial job they didn't even give to Jewish people because, you know, feet and sandals are gross. So Jesus is greater than John. And he's king over John and over everyone that John has been ministering to. But Jesus comes and baptizes with the Holy Spirit and fire. John, just water. Now, almost immediately after John says these things, Jesus comes for his own baptism. This brief scene does not focus on Jesus' baptism really at all. In fact, it is only mentioned in a grammatically subordinate clause, a participle. Luke, instead, focuses on the descent of the Holy Spirit upon Jesus and the voice from heaven. Luke mentions all of this heavenly recognition while Jesus is in prayer. And this is also the one occasion that we see where the John the Baptist is recorded to actually be with Jesus. That's not counting the pre-birth infantile jump for joy that happens in Elizabeth's womb, okay? So this story is told very, very briefly, but it's very important. It marks the call of Jesus' public ministry, a call accompanied by the gift of the Holy Spirit and confirmed by a voice in heaven. As he was praying, the heavens opened, and the Holy Spirit in bodily form descended on him like a dove, and a voice from heaven said, you are my dearly loved son, and you bring me great joy. That's pretty amazing. Many people these days turn to financial counselors for advice and help with investments. An article that I recently read urges the reader to carefully check out the potential advisor's credentials before you allow them any knowledge or access to your money. Well, that makes sense, right? If your money and your future security are at stake, it, you, you should have some good reason to trust the person who's giving you advice. So if it makes sense to check out the credentials of a financial advisor, it makes even more sense to be sure about the credentials of the one whom you entrust your eternal destiny and security to, your Savior. So while all the gospel accounts and even the Bible serve to establish the credibility of Jesus as the promised Messiah and Savior, Luke focuses on three lines of evidence prior to introducing the beginning of Jesus' ministry. The testimony of John the Baptist and God the Father and the Holy Spirit at Jesus' baptism the genealogy of Jesus, which we're considering right now, and then the victory over Satan's temptations that we're going to look at next week. So the genealogy of Jesus, this long list of names that I'm not going to read, <laughs> shows him to be God's promised Savior for all the people. One pastor recalls a trip that he took to New, Ze to New Zealand. It was an extended trip. He was taught how to greet an audience in the traditional Maori fashion. He enjoyed and appreciated the welcome that he was given by these ancient people, and many of whom are now devout Christians. 
and he had the chance of learning something about their history and culture. Did you know that many of the Maori people um, in New Zealand can tell you which of the original eight long canoes their ancestors arrived in when they first arrived in the country 800 to 1,000 years ago? And there's every reason to suppose that the memory of this family trees and their origins is reasonably accurate because it had been passed down from generation to generation to generation to generation. In our culture, we do not value our past or our history and how we came to be here. That's not as important to us as a culture. But to the Jewish culture, that was very important. So there's two genealogies in the Gospels, one in Matthew and one in Luke. In Matthew, we follow Jesus' family tree through Joseph, back through his ancestors to establish that Jesus has a legit right to the throne of David. Matthew establishes Jesus as the Messiah who has come for Israel. Luke, on the other hand, using 11 sets of seven names or generation, traces Jesus' family line all the way back to Adam in the Garden of Eden, to creation itself. Establishing that Jesus is the Son of God. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. So when Jesus is baptized and this voice of heaven is heard declaring that Jesus is the Son of God, and then this genealogy also establishes that Jesus is the Son of God, Jesus has come and he not only is he King over all, he is the Son of God. So what does that mean for you and I? For those of us who are seeking to live the Jesus life, I want to suggest four things. One, prepare yourself for the Jesus life. Hear the dire warnings of John the Baptist screaming in the desert to repent. Turn away from your sins and turn back to God. Whether you've never been a follower of Jesus before or you were and now you need to turn back again, turn towards Jesus in repentance. Jesus will take you in and offer you a new life, the Jesus life, and forgive your sins. Then your life should reflect this change. That's number two, right? Reflect the change. God gives, or John gives three very practical examples of a life that's been changed by repentance. Regular folks give to those who are in need. They cease to be selfish in their behavior, and they look out, they look to outward acts of love for their brothers and sisters in Christ. Corrupt, cheating tax collectors are admonished to conduct their business in an upright manner. Don't cheat people just because you can. Soldiers are encouraged to live with integrity and honesty. So what if you're not a tax collector, you're not a soldier? The other day I was out and about and I overheard some people talking. They were in a public place with other people all around and their language was riddled with profanity. Now, I was in the Navy, and untold teenagers that I've worked with have cussed me out through the years, so I'm no stranger to foul language. But the context and the mixed company and the casual way that was thrown around, it kind of took me by surprise, to be honest. Stopping that would be an example of a changed, repentant life, right? The Jesus life. Look. Each of you knows what behavior lurks in your life that needs addressing. Do that. Give more generously. Love more deeply. Be fair with people. Don't lie to get ahead. And number three, place your trust and confidence in Jesus, the Son of God, the King of all. He did not only come to save the Jews. He did not only come to save the disciples. He did not only come to save the Christians or the good boys and the good girls. He came for all. That's why his credentials go all the way back to the beginning of all things, when the Word spoke all things into being. He is the King of all because he is the Creator of all. We would do well to never forget that fact. So this is your homework. Read through the genealogy in Luke chapter 3, verses 23 through 38. Take note of the names. Look at the groupings of seven and remember that in all of these names, Jesus has always been there. Jesus is alive. 
He was and is and is to come. He is the Lord of lords and the King of kings and our Savior. He is worthy of your praise, deserving of your trust, and has the credentials to be the King over you too. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this day seeking to live the Jesus life. To take all that we know about you and put that into practice in our lives. Prepare our hearts, Lord, for this journey that we are on. In the areas in our life, Lord, where we have not turned back to you, where we have not repented, let us not waste another minute, but repent and turn to you right now. Whatever it is in our lives, Lord, and we each know of what that thing is, let us cut it away. Separate us from our lives. Separate it, Lord, from who we are and put in its place our devotion to you as we live the Jesus life. Let us follow after you. Let us conduct ourselves in a way that brings glory to you and honor to you. Let us be upright in everything that we do in our interactions with others. May we be people of integrity and honesty people of love and generosity. Lord, we just ask for your blessing to fall upon the lives of each person here, upon our community and our city. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen.